So, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining uh, this, the third and the last workshop uh, concerning the, the relevance of the geomatics techniques. So, I'm Alessandra Capulupo, and I'm an assistant professor of the Polytechnic of Bari, and I'm going to chair this session that is characterized by just by three contributions concerning the application of remote sensing techniques. So, since we are a little bit late, and I'm really sorry for that, so we can start. And uh, I invite here, uh, um, I invite here Carlo Barletta, Dr. Carlo Barletta, PhD at the University of the Politecnico di Bari, that is going uh, to present uh, a contribution titled Exploring the Potentialities of Landsat 8 and uh, Sentinel 2 Satellite Data for estimating the land surface albedo urban areas using GF plus. So, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carlo Barletta, and I'm going to present the results of our research titled Exploring the Potentialities of Landsat Data and Sentinel-2 Satellite Data for Estimating the Land Surface Albedo in Urban Areas Using Google Earth Engine Platform. The land surface albedo is a relevant parameter in many environmental and climate change studies, as it drives the land surface energy balance. As we know, today we are facing the issue of climate change, which is causing an increase of the Earth's surface temperature and a greater frequency of events such as heat waves, floods, storms, but also other environmental issues as desertification and drought. The urbanization process and consequently the land use and cover change modify the land surface energy balance. And so even the albedo, which is a biogeophysical variable that quantifies the capacity of a surface to reflect solar radiation, is modified. Anthropogenic and non-vegetated surfaces, in fact, are composed by non-reflective materials and the absorbed solar radiation is released has heat, triggering the so-called urban heat island effect. Albedo can be estimated effectively through Earth observation remote sensing technique. Uh, multispectral satellite images provided by missions as Landsat 8 with a geometric resolution of 30 meters or Sentinel-2 with a geometric resolution up to 10 meters are very suitable for the retrieving of albedo. However, the estimation of albedo is not easy and it is necessary to consider a compromise between the resulting map accuracy, the processing time and the complexity of the implemented algorithm. The retrieving of albedo also requires the knowledge of atmospheric conditions and the land surface characteristics. Processing satellite big data requires No, penso che lui sia in Gizzi. Vedo il senso. No, è da casa me l'ha detto. Uh, sorry for a while because we have uh, technical problems that we are trying to, to solve. Da Gizzi non si vede. Ti prova a condividere da qua sopra. Vai, vai. Vedi, prova ora. Vedi? Ok, so sorry for this inconvenience uh, and uh, I'm asking to the author to present again from the beginning because unfortunately okay. from home we were, not, was, we we're not able to see anything. Okay, good afternoon everyone, my name is Carlo Barletta and today I'm going to present the results of our research titled Exploring the Potentialities of Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2 satellite data for estimating the land surface albedo in urban areas using Google Earth Engine platform. 
The land surface albedo is a relevant parameter in many environmental and climate change studies as it drives the land surface energy balance. Today, we are facing the issue of climate change, which is uh, causing a greater uh, an increase of the Earth's surface temperature and uh, an increase of the frequency of events such as heat waves, floods, storms, and uh, other uh, environmental issues as desertification and growth. The urbanization process and consequently the land use land cover change modify the land surface energy balance and even the albedo, a biogeophysical variable that quantifies the capacity of a surface to reflect solar radiation is modified. Anthropogenic and non-vegetated surfaces are composed by non-reflective materials and the absorbed solar radiation is released as it triggering the so-called urbanitylam effect. Albedo can be estimated through Earth observation remote sensing technique and multispectral satellite images provided by missions as Landsat 8 with a geometric resolution of 30 meters and or Sentinel-2 with a, a geometric resolution up to 10 meters are very suitable for the retrieving of albedo from RGB near infrared and shortwave infrared spectral bands. However, the estimation of albedo is uh, not uh, easy and it is necessary to consider a compromise between the resulting map accuracy, the processing time, and the complexity of the implemented algorithm. The retrieving of albedo also requires the knowledge of atmospheric conditions and land surface characteristics. Processing the geospatial big data requires a lot of time and the advent of cloud services as Google Earth Engine opens up new opportunities to use and integrate diverse Earth observation datasets. Google Earth Engine is a free to use platform developed by Google, which allows users to process, uh, to process satellite big data by applying codes written in JavaScript or Python programming language. The aim of this research was to develop a proper JavaScript code in Google Earth Engine Cloud environment in order to extract land surface albedo information from two different satellite data, Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2, and evaluate and compare their performances. Two study areas were analyzed, the urban area of the city of Bari in southern Italy and the urban area of the city of Berlin in northeastern Germany. These territories are very different from a climatic and geomorphological point of view. Four images were processed, two regarding the study area of Bari and two regarding Berlin. All these images acquired in summer period are very close as regards acquisition time and have also a very low cloud cover, less than 3%. Here we see the workflow implemented in this study in a Google Earth Engine cloud environment to estimate the albedo. Once the images were collected, they were processed by applying the Silva algorithm specific for Landsat 8 data and the Bonafoni algorithm specific for Sentinel-2 data. Landsat 8 top of atmosphere reflectances and, surf and the Sentinel-2 surface reflectances were used. After obtaining uh, albedo maps, uh, a statistical comparison was performed. And in particular, the following statistics were calculated. Scatter plots, mean, correlation coefficient, standard deviations, and root mean square error. Moreover, these statistics were also extracted for each land cover class taken from Copernicus Land Monitoring Service Urban Atlas 2018. Here we see the land surface albedo maps retrieved for both Bari and Berlin study area after the application of the aforementioned algorithm. We see with letter A, Landsat 8 maps, and with letter B, the Sentinel-2 maps. From a visual inspection of these maps, we see that Berlin 
images are um, darker than those of Bari and that uh, Lanza Tate map obtained uh, from, uh, for a Bari area has the highest values. And this is uh, probably due to the different land cover between the two uh, cities, the different uh, climate and latitude. Or also to the fact that the Berlin territory has abundant surface water bodies which have uh, albedo values close to zero. Furthermore, Sentinel-2 maps are darker than uh, the corresponding Landsat 8 maps for both Bari and Berlin study area. Here we see the fundamental statistic matrix, the scatter plots between Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2 albedo estimations, and the box plots on the right of this slide of the albedo values. The scatter plots show that show a good correlation between uh, Lanzatite and Sentinel-2 estimation, but uh, several outliers are uh, present, in particular for Berlin study area, probably due to its greater size and heterogeneity in land cover than Bari territory. Bari Lanzatite map has uh, also the, me, uh, the highest mean value, the highest uh, correlation coefficient and root mean square error. The box plots uh, highlights the outlayers, which are um, due to the heterogeneity of the territories. In this uh, slide, we see the, um, uh, the results of the statistical analysis for each land cover class um, extracted from Copernicus Urban Atlas 2018. We see that uh, in, the, in the upper figure, the mean albedo values for uh, each land cover class. And uh, it is possible to notice that Bari has higher, higher values than Berlin, and that Landsat Tate algorithm provided higher mean values than the Sentinel 2 algorithm. Uh, in the lower figure, uh, there are the RMSSE values between Landsat Tate and Sentinel 2 for every land cover class and um, we uh, could see that uh, the RMSC trend is similar for uh, many land cover class with a difference of about 0.02 but there are some uh, uh, exceptions such as regarding areas as uh, port areas probably due to scattering problems of the sea or to the different geometric resolution between Lanza Tate and Sentinel-2. Uh, or also other um, areas as construction sites or forests, for example, because they are not very present in uh, Bari territory. So in conclusion, the two implemented algorithms provided the satisfying results in terms of correlation, standard deviation, root mean square error, and uh, um, the Albaite Lanzatate algorithm provided higher mean values for both study areas than the Sentinel 2 algorithm. Google Earth Engine Cloud Platform turned out to be an optimal tool for investigating geospatial big data because of its capability to customize codes, implement even complex algorithms, and minimize acquisition and operational time thanks to the presence of uh, the satellite images in Google Earth Engine data catalog and to the cloud technology. At the same time, it has uh, some disadvantages, such as the need to export maps in other software in order to improve the visualization of the results. This uh, work introduces also some innovative elements, such as that uh, potentialities of Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2 data were explored and compared, and that algorithms' performances were assessed considering the world study areas and each land cover class. Thank you for your kind attention. So, thanks, Dr. Barletta. Any question from the audience? No? Okay, so we can uh, move on because we are a little bit late. And now I invite uh, the second speaker of this session. Uh, to start to share his, uh, uh, his screen. So now it's the moment of, uh, I think, Professor Marco Scaglioni. No, maybe oh, the presenter is uh, Dr. Arsalan Malakin. Sorry for, uh, for that. 
that is going to present the contribution title to reduce surface reconstruction and change the detection of, of Miege Glaser Italy from multi-date archive aerial photos. So thank you for joining us and please. I'm not uh, hearing you. So we're going to switch on. Now, wait a moment because we are not hearing you. Try now to speak. No, nothing. Uh, try again. Now we should hear you. No. But uh, are the other people from Orma hearing you or not? No. Okay. So maybe is uh, your problem because no hearing is uh, is uh, hearing you. No one here, but uh, also the people that are in virtual are not hearing you. So try to switch uh, the uh, option of your laptop. Okay, so maybe when, uh, uh, no, maybe in the meantime, when you are trying to, to solve this technical issue, I can invite the third speaker of this session, Dr. Uh, uh, Claudio Ladisa. Uh, PhD student of the uh, Polytechnic Hello. that is going to present the contribution titled uh, Evaluation of a Cognition Developer and Fair Toolbox Performances for Assessing Agrophotovoltaic System from Sentinel to Images. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Alessandra. Are you are you seeing the screen? Just a moment. Sì. Okay. Thank you, Alessandra. Good evening. My name is Claudio Radisa. I'm a PhD of uh, Politecnico of Bari. Uh, my job, my work is about uh, the evaluation of uh, a commission de uh, developer and Orfeo toolbox performance for segmenting agrovoltaic system from Sentinel 2 images. So the first question is why I, I did uh, this job. Um, the need to tackle the climate change and uh, the imminent uh, depletion of oil, coal, and natural gas uh, service is leading the world to rely on uh, uh, renewable sources such as solar, wind, biomass, and geothermal energy. In particular, the strong construction and design cost decline, may, mainly due to higher um, energy productivity of PV modules, have promoted. Okay, have uh, promoted PV, uh, PV deployment. But what's the consequence of this uh, phenomenon? PV solar installation um, implies a consistent soil loss. So for this reason, in recent years, agrovoltaic systems have been uh, implemented to allow the simultaneous cultivation and production of uh, renewable um, energy and reducing island cons uh, consumption. So for this reason, for the, so for this, uh, development of the solar uh, energy and, and also from the health status of PV plants, it's very important, uh, the monitoring of PV plants. Uh, uh, the remotely pilot aircraft system image based assessment are considered as the, um, the uh, optimal solution to meet such a, uh, a purpose because of its competitive cost and fastness of, um, of monitoring the efficiency of system made up of many photovoltaic modules. 
but the development of large scale PV system uh, in recent years has made RPAS an ineffective techniques for monitoring them. So remote sensing can be a useful tool to analyze, uh, to analyze large scale PV plants. Among the several techniques uh, developed to process them, the object-based analyses are mainly adapted to, to extract land use, land cover information. Object-based image analysis uh, principle is to group together spectrally and geomor geomorphologically similar pixels to form objects which will be then classified. The step um, following um, object uh, identification is commonly called segmentation. This step can be performed by applying various software, such as such a, a condition development and offer toolbox. As the most by previous work, uh, a condition developer is suitable for segmented satellite images for or more cycle at larger scales because of its ability of producing a, a number of segments closer to the number of, of objects uh, defined as uh, ground true and uh, its processing speed. On the other hand, OTB is free open source software able to generate satisfied um, outcomes. So the, um, the, the main goal of my job was uh, the comparison of these two software, the, the performances of these two software for um, extracting solar pho uh, photovoltaic panels from Sentinel-2 time series on Monte, uh, Montalto di Castro, um, ex millennial site located close to Viterbo. The study area. Why I choose this study area? The pilot site is uh, located in Montalto di Castro, it's 42 kilometers far from uh, Terbo in the northern part of the Lazio region, central Italy. Uh, such re uh, rectangular area covers um, a surface of about uh, uh, six kilometers square, characterized by a predom uh, pred uh, predominant flat morphology. Um, it was uh, shows uh, uh, due to the presence of the largest photovoltaic plant system in Europe up to 2011. So the data set, um, 10 cloud-free Sentinel-2 scenes were collected over the study area from the European Space Agency. Um, and uh, uh, the level 2A was selected and all data provided in World Geodetic System M84, uh, Universal Transfer, uh, Transfer Mercator UTM Zone um, 32 North. So the method, uh, methodology, the digital, digitalization of PV planets located in the studio are um, uh, allows having the ground true uh, for um, assessing segmentation quality. So um, after digital, uh, digital, uh, digitalizing the solar park manually, the uh, operating workflow uh, was applied. Once uh, uh, sentinel two images were collected, they were segmented in uh, a condition de uh, developer and um, a notable. Then a, um, a multi-parameter approach based on scale, shape, and compactness parameter was applied in a, a condition platform. And um, instead, a, a main shift segmentation used uh, in OTB uh, platform. Contrary to the, techni uh, to the technique um, adopted in a condition, fixed values were picked up um, in this case. Then for each segmented image, AD2 was calculated. The smallest AD2 value corresponds to the, to the best segmentation parameter set, set for each image. AD2 outcomes uh, were compared. Some, some output segmentation from the two software that show an abnormal AD2 values were sub subjected to a conversion procedure aimed at, um, at masked all pixels characterized by an anomalous uh, reference value. And lastly, software performance were also investigated in terms of processing time, versatility, and cost. So let's focus about the segmentation algorithm. The, the multi-resolution image uh, segmentation performance uh, depends on three main parameters. The first scale parameter uh, is uh, responsible for defining the maximum um, admissible heterogeneity. The larger the value, the larger the, uh, the resulting um, object is. Uh, scale ranged between uh, 20 and uh, 
100 with the um, an increment uh, uh, step of one. The second uh, is the shape. The, the shape assigns a weight to the uh, to the shape and the spectral color of the ob uh, objects. When the shape weight uh, is zero, only the value um, assigned to the color is considered. While when uh, it's greater than zero, the shape of uh, object is taken uh, into account along with the color. It was between uh, 0.1 and 0.5 with a step of increment of uh, uh, 0.1. And lastly, the weight of compactness and uh, um, smoothness criteria useful for um, optimizing um, overall compactness. The, the parameters of the main shift segmentation in OCB are spatial radius and range radius. Uh, the spatial radius is uh, the, the the average of the number of pixels of uh, each uh, uh, object uh, uh, segmented, uh, and the range radius is the maximum difference between uh, um, the two borderline pixels. So the the, um, the procedure of the segmentation <laughs> was the evaluation of the time trend of the uh, the two. Uh, index and uh, then the um, estimation of the dextrative statistics of polygon geometries and ground true and um, and lastly uh, the assessment of the processing times to perform the segmentation process so uh, in, um, in this figure this figure reports the trends of the modified edit, edit two um, index for all segmented uh, segmented uh, Images produced uh, produced by applying air condition development. Most of the images uh, reach the lowest AD2 value, setting the shape uh, equal to 0 0.5 and the scale range between 36 and 55. The best AD2 value 0 0.454 was shown from the uh, image acquired in August using the 53 and 0 0.3 for the scale and the shape. On the other hand, uh, instead the uh, image belonging to um, October and November reported an, um, an anomalous trend uh, and November showed the highest value of 82 and scale. Scale and shape values uh, useful to um, obtain the cor uh, corresponding minimum 82 value for each um, uh, 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 for each image uh, is reported in the table. So uh, this, uh, this figures uh, describe the, the trend of the minimum uh, value of AD2 obtained by projecting the, uh, the images in a condition developer and an OTB. A quite similar trend is uh, detected using both software from February until uh, September. Uh, these figures um, enhance the um, anomalies uh, already noted in November and October outcomes uh, generated using uh, um, high condition developer. Um, also, uh, uh, OTB shows uh, an anomaly in November, um, um, even though uh, it is less marked. On the contrary, any anomalies are not uh, detected in, uh, uh, in OTB for October. This table uh, reports uh, the total amount of uh, obtained polygons generated using a condition developer and uh, an OTB. Uh, furthermore, the number of uh, polygons uh, intersected with ground two is shown too. Um, a condition developer produces more polygons than OTB accepted in, uh, in November. Uh, polygons um, intersect in the ground two are greater in a condition developer than in OTB. This uh, figure shows the matrix calculated on polygons um, intersected with the, the ground two samples. In particular, um, it can be seen that uh, the areas of the polygons uh, of the polygons intersected with the ground tube produced by OTB have a higher average value than those um, obtained from ground tube polygons for almost under uh, analyzed. 
applied, a condition developer produces a resource with a more uh, fluctuating trend, always below the average value of ground truth, except uh, in uh, September. The coefficient of uh, variation uh, value showed the more heterogeneity in the, poly in, the, in, the pol in the polygons generated by um, a condition developer. The values of standard deviation, the median, the CV, and, um, and, the minimum uh, and the minimum show more small segments for the condition developer in November. So the, um, this table, uh, table describes the processing time needed in a condition developer and OTB. Uh, a condition developer time involves the work time uh, required to carry out the complete, uh, the complete segmentation procedure, including the variation of the parameter. Conversely, OTB time is, uh, uh, is referred just to a single segmentation since the default value are, uh, are used. Um, all, the, uh, all the areas of um, images characterized by unusual uh, reflectance values were masked and both segmentation algorithms were reapplied on the, um, on the resultant maps. As shown before, um, in a condition developer, AD, uh, AD2 values were lowered compared to the original uh, images. In OTB, on the other hand, slightly higher AD2 values were um, obtained in October and November than in the unmasked images. Uh, regarding poly uh, polygon statistics, statistics in uh, an ignition developer, the total number of polygons is such much bigger than the, the one uh, reported before. This is due to the scale value change. In OTB, the total polygon value did not change much. Polygons um, intersected with ground truth uh, decreased both in ignition and OTB. Uh, statistics show an increment of median value in a condition developer for November and uh, a decrement of standard deviation value. This, is, uh, this uh, suggests that uh, a lower number of, of small segments can be detected. So, in conclusion, a condition uh, produces more polygons than OTB and consequently the uh, intersection with ground true samples was higher um, um, even though the area sum was higher in um, OTB case. Uh, this is confirmed um, um, also by the relative high median value at uh, a relatively low standard deviation value. They enhance the tendency of the meshif algorithm to create larger polygons than down to sample. Additionally, OTB produce a narrow range of polygon size. So polygons generated by, of, uh, by a condition developer were more adapted to the selected ground true sample. Although the, uh, the same laptop was uh, used uh, to process the data. Um, a condition developer showed a better performance considering that arranged parameters were tested and, and non-self-intersected uh, polygons were generated. Indeed, uh, in the case of OTB, just single default uh, values were um, evaluated and all the segmented uh, polygons produced by OTB were characteriz uh, characterized by self-intercepted polygons, uh, subsequently fixed. This made the project slower and, and complex. In addition, uh, a condition developed demonstrated greater versatility and uh, completeness in uh, managing segmentation parameters than OTB as well uh, as better, um, handling uh, heavy uh, geospatial data. In conclusion, both software show a promising results since they generate uh, since they generate um, acceptable segmentation outcomes. However, some differences have to be considered. First of all, um, a condition developer allowed um, extracting uh, fewer large uh, fewer large uh, segments than those one um, um, obtained using the. Uh, OTB. Second, uh, considering the work time needed to remove uh, self intercepted polygons, a condition developer um, environment was faster in uh, meeting the goal. And third, uh, in a condition developer, uh, developer uh, amplified the, uh, the anomalies uh, detected in October and November, and so the, the images used in, in multi, uh, multi resolution algorithms may be pre processed adequately. 
So a cognition developer can, can be recognized as the optimal um, of, um, tool for segmented lead um, input images, but uh, um, it's higher cost and uh, a strong limitation in those projects characterized by limited budget. Um, in this case, uh, OTB um, uh, is better uh, in uh, uh, where the, um, the, the budget is not uh, much like uh, in other projects. So in the, um, in the future, um, other uh, segmentation algorithm will be tested and compared to uh, segment uh, Sentinel-2 images to um, identify uh, the optimal strategy to, uh, to adopt uh, and to improve PV, uh, photovoltaic parts classific uh, classification accuracy. Thank you so much for, uh, for your attention. So thank you for your... Thank you for your contribution. Any question or curiosity? Okay. So I can ask to Dr. Uh, sorry for a while because I'm in, uh, Arsalan Malakin to share his screen. And uh, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Now we can. Okay. Great. So, now, the last contribution is of this session that is uh, titled 3D Surface Reconstruction and Change Detection of Miege Glacier, Italy, from uh, Multidate Archive Aerial Photos. Please, Dr. Uh, Maliakin, go uh, ahead. Can you see my presentation? Yes, but not in the presentation mode. Now, yes, perfect. Okay, great. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Sorry for the inconvenience that happened. Uh, my name is Arsalan Malekian from Polytechnic University of Milan. Uh, I'm very glad uh, I'm here today with you. I present for you the recent work uh, we have done with Professor Marco Esconi and uh, Davide Fugazza about uh, 3D surface reconstruction and mass loss uh, investigation of glacier uh, in North Italy called Miage Glacier by using some aerial uh, archival photos. Uh, as I said, the study area is located uh, in northwest Italy in an area called the uh, Alsta Valley. There are lots of uh, glaciers in this region, as you see, uh, and the focus of uh, our work is on, uh, is on the area which is called Valveni. Here we have considerably large glaciers, uh, and uh, in this work we talk about uh, Miage Glacier. Uh, here we take a closer look to this glacier. Uh, Miage is the longest glacier in Italy and biggest uh, debris covered glacier in Europe. Uh, this lower part is around five square kilometers and uh, it continues to the upper parts uh, as we saw in the previous slide. And it's uh, five kilometers far from, far from the city called uh, Kormeyer. Uh, here, uh, is a, here is a video uh, from the incident that unfortunately happened a couple of days ago in north uh, east of Italy and part of Marmolada glacier collapsed and uh, killed six people and uh, led to injury uh, and missing of some uh, hikers in that area and it's very relevant to incident uh, to, uh, to, the in to uh, it's very relevant incident to what uh, we are talking about in this presentation. So uh, Valveni region as well as Marmolada is exposed to glacier related hazards due to presence of large glaciers. So here, for example, extremely warm weather can increase the uh, level of water in these lakes that uh, were created on the surface of glacier and lead to uh, glacial uh, lake outburst uh, floods. Another hazard that uh, can, can be considered for Miage is debris flow, but uh, due to lower slope, uh, it's rare to happen in the upper parts. Also, uh, also uh, rock falls and ice avalanches may occur at the upper parts uh, of this glacier. So all this uh, glacier related hazard can be caused by mass loss uh, uh, in the glacier. And we try to find the mass loss uh, of this glacier uh, in this area. So to find the uh, mass loss in this glacier, we had some aerial uh, archival scanned images from National uh, Institute of Geographic Information and Forestry of France that covered this area. But before the 3D reconstruction uh, of this area, uh, photos should be edited in Adobe Lightroom in, uh, to adjust the clarity and contrast 
uh, in the photos to have better feature extraction and feature matching uh, in the next phases. So we can go on with the uh, AG soft metership for pre-calibration, georeferencing, alignment uh, of images and 3D point cloud generation. And finally, uh, volume and uh, height variation of Miage Glacier are investigated by using 3D point clouds uh, in Cloud Comper. So we have a different number of images of different years from 1967 to 2006 uh, over the area uh, that we saw. As you can see, number of uh, photos are quite low, especially in older data sets uh, as they were uh, obtained uh, for uh, purposes other than 3D surface reconstruction. And the most recent uh, data set belongs to 2006. Uh, also, the coverage area of the photos play an uh, important role in the final density of the point cloud and higher coverage area uh, with lower uh, number of images, uh, like the case uh, we have uh, on the data set uh, 1988, uh, may lead to lower density in some part of 3D model. I should add that all the photos were obtained mostly during warmer months uh, of the year between uh, July and September. And it provides a reasonable comparison of uh, mass loss as all data sets were roughly obtained under the same uh, weather condition. Uh, here is an example of photos that we have. They provide information such as camera, uh, camera coordinates and altitude uh, that may be used uh, to find the coordinates of points and camera position. Also date and time of the photography and also some red marks that are called facial marks. That is, a, that is an option to be used for the alignment of the photos if the coordinates uh, of them uh, are known. So to reconstruct a 3D model uh, from 2D photos, uh, we use a structure from motion algorithm. Briefly, it consists of two main parts. First, uh, it tries to match extracted points uh, from the images and find uh, blunders. In the next part, uh, two images that have most geometrically verified key points are uh, used to, uh, to, uh, for initial uh, 3D point cloud reconstruction and estimation of camera position. And then uh, new photos will be added. Triangulation technique is used for uh, find the coordinates of new points and bundle adjustment is used to uh, refine the uh, reconstructed model to get the optimum condition and finally, Multi-view stereo technique uh, produced the final uh, 3D dense cloud. Uh, before going on with the 3D reconstruction, we have some challenges to deal with. The uh, uh, first challenge uh, in working with archival images is lack of ground control points, as it is a very important property in uh, 3D reconstruction. Uh, we use satellite data to get uh, the coordinates of uh, stable points, uh, uh, like houses or crossroads for all the data sets. Uh, another problem is presence of shadows as, and the snow covers uh, uh, that hide the feature uh, in some uh, photos that uh, make uh, make it difficult for the feature extraction and feature matching algorithm to work properly. Properly, uh, this problem can be can be reduced in some cases by editing the images before the reconstruction, and in some cases. Um, we may have some gaps like this one uh, and the outliers in the 3D model. Uh, after the after the 3D reconstruction, we have uh, seven uh, 3D models for uh, seven different years, and we can start the comparison of the point cloud. Uh, before that, uh, uh, first the uh, noises and outliers of point clouds should be removed, like uh, this lake around the glacier that is full of noises and may lead to inaccuracy uh, in comparison. Then. Uh, your reference point uh, have the same coordinates uh, in all the models, so they are already aligned uh, on each other when we want to compare cloud pairs. Uh, but uh, other parts uh, should be co-registered as well. Uh, to do so, uh, as we have very large area, it's better to better it's better approach to apply iterative closest point method to, to co-register uh, probable uh, stable uh, parts uh, and then apply the transformation matrix to the other parts. In this way, we prevent uh, the error caused by noises and outliers uh, in point loads. And finally, multi-scale model-to-model algorithm is used uh, for the comparison of uh, co-resistor uh, co uh, cloud pairs. Uh, after the comparison of the cloud pairs, we have uh, 
uh, after the comparison of the cloud pairs from 1967 to 2006, we can get uh, the height and volume uh, changes during these years. Here you can see the distribution of mass loss over the Miage glacier over the years. Uh, green and blue colors show the height, uh, height loss uh, that occurred mostly from 2000 onwards. Uh, then from volume calculation, uh, uh, rate of thickness change is obtained during the years. Trend showed negative uh, thickness uh, change rate. However, it was a small value until the end of 90s, but uh, uh, until the end of 90s, the, but uh, the rate uh, reached a peak of minus 1.2 uh, meter per year in the beginning of 21st century and uh, was around one meter per year until 2006. Also, if we take a look at uh, uh, the trend of mean height change, uh, we find out generally height reduction in glacier. However, we had the increase of height until uh, 1988, uh, but from 1988 to 2000, we have a negative trend. And then until 2006, this negative trend was doubled to nearly minus four meters of uh, mean height reduction. Uh, in conclusion, we can say that uh, pre-processing is a crucial element when uh, dealing with uh, archival photos. Ground control points should be chosen accurately as they play an uh, important role in uh, 3D reconstruction accuracy. And applying transformation matrix obtained from co-registration of a stable zone lead to uh, more accurate aligning of cloud pairs to have a more accurate comparison. Finally, we can say that a huge mass loss uh, in uh, Miyaj Glacier was visible by the start of 21st century and uh, uh, increased the uh, glacier, uh, and it's this uh, incident increased the glacier related hazard in the area. And further investigation about the current situation of Miyaj Glacier by using uh, new aerial photos can be combined with the result of this work. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, if you have any question, I'm ready to answer. So, thank you, Dr. Maria Kin. Any question? Sorry for the pronunciation. I don't know if it is correct or not. No, it's okay. <laughs> so, if no one has uh, any curiosity to ask to any one of the other photos, I can say that uh, this session is at the end, and I want to uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. And uh, I want also to thank you, the organizer, but in particular, all the technicians that uh, help us to face every kind of issue. And uh, I encourage everyone to continue to follow this conference in the next day. So, bye.
Hello. Uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, we are. Sorry. I, we are my mask. But now um, I can uh, go out my, my mask. So uh, we can start our session today. And uh, just a few words before I start this session. Uh, this is a, a workshop, the PCIoT workshop. Uh, inside the ICSA um, uh, conference. And uh, I want just to spend a few words to thank you. Uh, everyone uh, could be this possible. So every authors that submit uh, your works to this uh, workshop. And I want to um, thank you, the local organization, and of course, uh, the general chair and the general organization of the conference that may be this uh, possible. Uh, so the first uh, uh, the first work of this uh, day is uh, the work that is uh, presented by me uh, because uh, I am one of the author because I am in presence here I starting to present uh, the this uh, uh, this work Okay, just a moment. Was it? Uh, just uh, one moment because uh, oh, this. Okay. Uh, no. 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 Oh, okay. Okay. I, I think so. Okay. So uh, the first, uh, this first work is um, entitled "The Sensitive Information Detection: Adopting a Name It Entity Recognition uh, a Proposed Methodology." Uh, this work uh, was by me. That is, uh, I am Lelio Campanile. And with the contribution of Maria Stella De Biase, Stefano Marrone, Fiametta Marulli, Maria Pia Remondo, and Laura Verde. Okay, uh, this is the outline of this presentation. Uh, in our presentation, we're starting uh, to approach, in general way, the information and the privacy world. So everything about the data in the privacy world. And then uh, we deep in, um, uh, in anonymization, uh, issues about NLP. And uh, then the proposed methodology of this work, that is the main part of this article. Uh, and finally, the case study with result and some conclusion and uh, ideas for future works. Okay, uh, what's about sensitive information? Um, today, nowadays, uh, we have a lot of information. Uh, information is pervasive, and we have a trillion of information that's uh, circulating in the internet, uh, on media, and over, everywhere, I think, on journal, uh, and, uh, but uh, the most important part was about internet, and uh, is about, uh, it's uh, a lot of very uh, enormous number of information. And many of these information are sensitive information, because uh, sensitive information that was, uh, uh, kind of uh, personal information, network identity information, secret information, and okay, um, credential. Uh, another um, category of information that are very sensible was the financial information. Uh, just for um, take a little example of this kind of information, uh, as uh, personal information, we um, consider, for example, name, surname, that is a uh, uh, information sensitive but not very sensitive information but if, uh, if you think about uh, uh, information about health or religious orientation or some things of that there there are very very uh, sensitive information and uh, we need to protect this kind of information uh, of course network identity information are another kind of information very important to protect because in this uh, uh, in this field that we consider uh, the ip address for example or the information about our wi-fi the password of our wi-fi and all these things 
um, now we now to spend a few words about the nature of this data because uh, we have two different kind of data uh, that circulate on internet and in special way on internet and are structured one and unstructured data. The structured data is a very particular kind of data and we refer about um, database, for example, or data that are very, very uh, structured. So, uh, I mean, when I uh, told about structured data, I told about data that could be automatized in the same way. But in this works, uh, we uh, focus on unstructured data. Uh, the unstructured data for this works is uh, um, in large part uh, concerned about natural language information. And so, for example, uh, we have emails, journal articles, social network posts. Everything is written or everything in some way is speaked about someone and uh, every, uh, everything um, is lived on the internet. I mean, video, everything, because uh, from audio you can get the text of this audio and you, can, you have natural language information about that. And of course, uh, if you, um, I, I mean, you, you can uh, think only about your chats, your WhatsApp, your Telegram, everything uh, similar to that. You have a lot, uh, very lot privacy concern about this kind of information. So in our works, uh, we uh, focus on this kind of, uh, uh, of information. So about natural language. Uh, the privacy is a very important uh, topic in the last years and is not a uh, topic of only for researchers, but it's a very important topic for uh, um, government of uh, every place in the world. And in particular, Euro uh, European Union proposed a United Regulation, uh, GDPR, that is a General Data Protection Regulation. Uh, but uh, in uh, many other countries in the world, uh, there is a spotlight attention on privacy and some similar, I mean, uh, the GDPR was one of the first of this kind of regulation and this uh, uh, take as example uh, from other country, for example, the, the China privacy regulation. Um, in the United States, uh, this kind of regulation is uh, demanded to the states. So for example, in uh, California, uh, the state of California enacted uh, um, an unsimilar, I mean, inspired to GDPR uh, law. Uh, what is the most important things about data? I mean, okay, the GDPR is a very uh, large law. We don't focus in this work about the law aspect, but it's important uh, to understand that uh, uh, all the things related to machine learning, for example, is not allowed on raw data. So you're not, not allowed by the GDPR. So you cannot use your data if you collect them to automatic elaboration, to machine learning, or uh, all these uh, other things. Um, this is a very enormous limit uh, for research. This is enormous limits for a lot of things, a lot of, uh, I mean, exciting things to do with this data. How we can uh, do uh, to, um, I mean, use this data? One of the most important and the first one is uh, try to anonymize this data. So if you anonymize this data, you can use uh, this data for a uh, more large, more large using. Okay, mm, as I told just before, we, we are focusing in this works about natural language and we speaking uh, of machine learning and natural language is uh, very natural uh, to go uh, in direction of NLP. What is NLP? NLP is uh, natural language processing, is uh, a specific subfield of machine learning uh, for analyzing and in some way understanding, okay, with uh, very uh, some limits understanding, uh, natural language data. But in this case, so in this work, we use NLP to try to anonymize data for the purpose of course of automatic processing and of course next we can use this data anonymized uh, also for machine learning but not only for machine learning of course 
um, more specific in this work, we propose a methodology for detecting the identifying sensitive information. Why we want to identify this information for the purpose of obfusc um, obfuscating this, so to uh, hide this information in some way, this is sensible information in, in some way. And uh, of course, the, um, the main goal is to preserve the person price. Okay, so uh, uh, do you think that natural NLP is uh, the solution for all these things? So you can use NLP and solve your problem because NLP is machine learning. NLP can in some way automatically detect this, uh, uh, this kind of uh, information. So uh, automatic uh, detection of uh, name or name of organization, name of person. So all these uh, uh, stuff that you need to anonymize. But NLP have some cons uh, to consider. One of these is that uh, to work um, in a good way, NLP needs a large text corpus. And uh, then if you have this large corpus, you need a very intensive computi um, computational intensive uh, power to train correct the model. So this is a, a very, very enormous cons in this case. Um, of course, uh, exist some tools and uh, exists also uh, a lot of pre-trained models. So you can use this very easily. But also these pre-trained models have uh, um, a many cons. Uh, the most important of these cons was that uh, they are trained for general topics, so no specific topics, and they are very good trained for English language. Existing for Italian, but they don't work very well. They work so very poorly, poorly results. Uh, so we, um, in this works, we, um, uh, we use a new approach, um, a kind of different approach. I mean, uh, I, uh, I named this approach uh, in some way hybrid approach uh, because we use NLP in traditional way, but then uh, we specialize the differently the things. So to, do, to achieve this goal, uh, we need a kind of domain taxonomy. What is a domain taxonomy? It is defined as uh, uh, in specific field. So the specific field in this case was uh, the juridical field and a specific language that is the Italian language. So we define this uh, kind of uh, taxonomy that using the next, I, um, <clears throat> I, um, I, I, I uh, take you an example of this taxonomy in the case study. Uh, and this is uh, the big picture of our methodology. Uh, so the methodology consists of uh, uh, many steps, in this case, five steps. The first step was data acquisition. Then we have an error application, context doing definition, tag evaluation, and finally the dinner definition. Okay, but I explain this uh, better in the next slide. Uh, the first two steps: data acquisition and error application. In the first step, the data acquisition is uh, the step in which you get all your data from all your documents. So you have raw data for documents, email, text etc everything you need to collect and need to elaborate uh, the next step is a narrow application in our application we use uh, effectively the um, nlp standard nlp so we use uh, application of uh, NER in this case so uh, using a, a very uh, common a very famous uh, tool uh, written in python that is spacey spacey toolkit that uh, it has a pre-trained model for general Italian. Uh, so this general model uh, works uh, not very well. In fact, uh, in this case, he, 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 uh, it is capable to classify only four different categories, four different tags that are a lot that's the location, miscellaneous, uh, organization, and person. Okay, um, to compare, the difference between uh, Italian and English. In English, uh, the same tool, so Spacey, it's capable uh, to uh, classify 18 different tags. So this is a, a lot of difference. 
And uh, so uh, the next step in our methodology is to define a context window. So what is a context window? So it's a, a very important concept in this uh, methodology because uh, we need to, uh, for each word target by NER, so by the general NER, uh, we have to pick up uh, um, a number, I mean in this I, uh, I number, the previous and the number of next word. So we centered the word of the um, target by the NER and pick up the first, for example, five words and the uh, next five words. So we have a context window. And um, in this context windows, we compare to have a, um, a better subfield, subcategory of the word. Uh, of course, the value of N is critical uh, because if N is uh, large, you you can have some problem if and in same thing in same way if it's too small you you could have a problem the the opposite problem so we can not uh, get get um, good results uh, so uh, the evaluation uh, this is uh, the core i think of our methodology because in the evaluation step each word in the context windows is compared with the word in the domain taxonomy. So the accuracy is evaluated by a, a named D function. D function is defined by us, and the D function take into account a lot of measurement that is a lexical, semantic, and taxonomy that are the typical measure that you, measure that you can use in an LP. Uh, of course, in general way, in this methodology, you can use a different method because this is a general uh, methodology. We cannot focus on only one kind of methods, but it's general, and then you can use what you need in this in your specific uh, case. In your specific case, then uh, the similarity function is applied to each word in the context windows and evaluate its similarity to the words of domain taxonomy. Okay, more details about this uh, step you can find inside the article, the journal article, because this is a, a little bit tricky parts. Um, but the important is the definition of the function and the definition of function that is uh, have two arguments, that is uh, the word of context windows, of course, the WC, and the word of the domain taxonomy. This is the, the first argument of uh, the distance function that we define it. And uh, this distance function is um, defined uh, uh, of the uh, contribution of these three uh, principal, principal uh, contribution that the LC and key. Uh, LC and key are the sum of similar, similar metrics of lexical, respectively, semantic, and taxonomy. Um, of course, P, PL and PC and PK are a kind of weight for this stream because uh, we need uh, to uh, weight each, uh, I mean, the weight of each contribution. In some cases, you could, for example, have a more contribution about uh, P con L, so you have more contribution from the lexical point of view or the semantic point of view. Each of these, of course, you have here the different sum. Uh, what meaning this sum is very uh, simple to understand. This is the sum because you could use, if you want, more than one matrix for each of these. And you need to sum this contribution. In the sum, you can, of course, uh, uh, balance uh, the weights of, of, of this contribution. Okay, so uh, now you are um, this kind of distance, you calculate this distance, and you have a matrix, a general matrix that is uh, summarized in this D value. And now the final step <coughs> is the DNR, DNR application. What is DNR? Uh, DNR is an acronym that is uh, Domain Name Entity Recognition, because uh, this is uh, the step uh, that we <laughs> perform it in these uh, works uh, because it consists in a definition of a specialized context windows based nerve. 
So the denial is applied to select taxpayer documents and to perform a second tagging evaluation. So you choose the first, the first step, if you remember, so the second step in reality, you perform the denial to your document and you tag it this with the, the simple denial of space in this case. So we, for example, um, tag it to person something, the denial sub tag this word with uh, a different category, a subcategory. So uh, you are able to more specialize this kind of, uh, of, uh, um, of word. This is a very important uh, to have a more fine, a more um, granular uh, possibilities to uh, anonymize your data. Okay, uh, the case study. Uh, we test, of course, our methodology. Mm, uh, since already this is a preliminary test because it is a very experimental, uh, the, the data set was composed by 29 civil judgment uh, in Italian language, uh, and uh, we have an average of uh, 896 words for document. This is only, an, of course, an average. And uh, we focus in this test only on the person category of general NER because it's one of the most important category in this kind of, of uh, uh, anonymization because, of course, you need to anonymize uh, the name of the people in your, in your um, sentences. Okay, this is the example that I, I told just uh, uh, some slides ago. Uh, this is uh, the domain taxonomy for juridical uh, field. Okay, this is in Italian because uh, the documents are in Italian, but you can see here that is a person, that is the category, and then this is the subcategory that you can more specify with this kind of approach. Uh, this table uh, is uh, the word that you can use here to uh, specify, for example, the subcategory, in this case, avocado. Okay, so this is the example. And um, what are the results for our uh, methodology? Uh, the standard NER, so performed with spacing, identified the um, 957 uh, person tax. Uh, we set the size of the context windows to five. Uh, we chose this uh, by experiment. So we chose and uh, uh, use it to different value, and then we choose the best result. And after the application of the next steps, we obtain then uh, 86 words with the more specific category. So it's about 10% uh, of a person generic lab specialized for some category. Uh, it is, uh, I mean, not uh, a clamor, it's not the best result in the world, but it's a very good result because uh, everything uh, working uh, NLP know how this is very difficult to, um, uh, to get bad performance in this, in, this, uh, in this field. So conclusion, uh, in this work, uh, we present a methodology to automatically anonymize personal data. This methodology is able to extract linguistic feature from various kind of uh, document, textual document. And then we use an hybrid, I mean, hybrid approach using classical net and then uh, applying an heuristic, a kind of heuristic self defined uh, function to get better accuracy in, uh, in uh, defining subcategory. Of course, the final goal is uh, got good subcategory to anonymize this subcategory in the right way and not to anonymize everything because this is another another problem future works i think that uh, after this uh, article this is a lot of works to do uh, because this uh, works uh, in my opinion and in my project is represented the foundation on which extend and improve this methodology uh, of course this is a preliminary study but because it's a foundation i think that the methodology is uh, uh, fix it and uh, we can improve the various phases of this methodology. For example, one of the most important is uh, the choosing about uh, the different kind of function that you can use in uh, for the lexical, for example, or for 
uh, the semantic uh, contribution. Uh, of course, the case study should be extended to other, to other fields. It's very important. For example, uh, you can choose another field for this, the health field that have, uh, of course, uh, the difficulty in this case was that you need to create a new uh, domain taxonomy and the domain taxonomy need the human, uh, human intervention, it's very large human intervention. intervention. Okay, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, if someone has uh, any question, I am here to answer your question. Okay, I think uh, no question because I am of the chair of this session is uh, not opportunity that I question myself. So <laughs> I go to the next uh, presentation. Uh, the next presentation, uh, okay, is uh, from uh, uh, Carlos Angus. So. Good afternoon. Hello. Can you, uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yeah, we okay. hear very well. Okay. And uh, just uh, let me present your works uh, that's entitled uh, Evaluating the Impact of Data Anonymization in a Machine Learning Application. So you can start, you can share your screen and start your presentation. Okay. Let's start. Okay, we can see. Can you your see me? Can you see? Yeah. Is it okay? Okay. Okay. Hey, hi, hello to everyone. Uh, my name is Carlos Angers, and uh, before I start with my presentation, I would like to thank Lelio Campanile, Fabio Forgiuni, Michele Mastroianni, and Gianfranco Palmiero. The title of uh, our work is Evaluate the Impact of Data Anonymization a machine learning application. So it's an outline. After a very short introduction about uh, the experiments, about uh, our work, I will show you the goal of our experiment. The, then I will talk about the methodology we used in order to achieve our goal. Uh, then I will talk about uh, our case study and uh, conclusions and the future uh, works. So, uh, what about uh, the data protection impact uh, assessment? The data protection impact assessment is uh, a sort of procedure, I mean a process, that try, tries to help us uh, to uh, improve uh, the manage of uh, uh, of risk to the rights of and freedoms of individuals. The scope of uh, this uh, uh, process theoretically is every system that collects personal uh, uh, data. When I say pers a system, I mean uh, a, a software system. Okay, but uh, we also know that uh, there are some con test in which it's uh, impossible to provide a good service uh, without uh, the use of uh, personal data. Just consider the case of a uh, uh, wireless internet service provider that wants uh, to offer a good connection. In order to do that, uh, the wireless internet service provider needs to predict the failures of a customer achievement. And uh, uh, in order to achieve this goal, there is the need of a, a sort of a full failure prediction system. This kind of system are uh, basically um, uh, a, a sort of a machine learning system. And this machine learning system need personal data during the uh, training phase. Uh, this failure prediction system need personal data during the prediction phase, etc., cetera, uh, et cetera. So uh, what about our goal? 
uh, the goal of our experiment was to evaluate the data protection impact assessment, assessment in two cases. In the first one, uh, the system uses uh, personal data. In the second uh, scenario, in the second case, the system, I mean the whole system, uh, use, uses, uh, non, uh, uses anonymous uh, data. So no personal data in the second scenario. We want to understand how the, the data protection impact assessment, how the um, risk level uh, change when we switch from a situation where we have personal data to a situation where we have only anonymous data. We don't care do in, in our experiment about the performance in terms of fault prediction. What about so our uh, methodology? Our methodology was based on a process that uh, has the, the goal of to identify uh, risks from the processing of personal data. This process uh, helps us to uh, uh, reduce the, these uh, risks. The name of this process, I said before, is the uh, data protection impact assessment. We know that this process is often used to demonstrate uh, GDPR compliance, but in our work, we used this, uh, the process of uh, data protection impact assessment only to check how good the data anonymization solutions were. We care only about uh, the risk level. We don't care about, uh, uh, you don't care too much about of uh, fault prediction uh, system and, uh, the, and the performance of machine learning models. So it's uh, the, our case study uh, is based on a wireless internet service provider. Uh, its name is Flyber. Flyber is based on uh, Teverola and uh, Flyber offers its customer free technical support uh, in order to offer the best connection. In order to offer the best connection, uh, the staff, the staff, uh, the tech staff of Flyber uh, needs to know the quality of a signal reception, and uh, they need to they need to know a lot of more information. We also know that uh, the best practice say that if you want to, if Flyber wants to offer a good uh, provider, good service to its customer, uh, they uh, uh, um, Flyber needs to take action before a blocking radio failure. So Flyber needed and needs a, a system that uh, predicts failure. The staff of Flyber normally has access to a lot of personal information. I mean, the MAC address of the customer's device, the geolocation of the customer device, a lot of uh, personal information. Uh, they, uh, the, the people uh, of the staff of Flyber, uh, can know if a customer is uh, at home or not. Uh, they have a lot of information about the most used streaming service, Netflix or Amazon Prime Video. And uh, they know uh, where, when is the uh, most peak during the day, etc., etc. In a few words, the risks for individuals are uh, hi. Just a few words about uh, the raw data set. In the very first uh, our experiment, uh, the system uses a raw data set uh, uh, represented by 25 columns, and of these columns, some contain personal data. I already say customer code, the best name of customer, the zip code of a customer, etc., uh, etc. What about the, uh, uh, the fault protection uh, prediction procedure in Flyber? Flyber uh, uh, uses a very simple uh, procedure, three 
steps. The first step is to save the raw data on the monitoring server. The second step is to send the raw customer data to the machine learning application. And the third step is fault prediction through the machine learning model. Okay, well, but uh, the problem here is uh, L. what if something uh, goes uh, wrong? We um, uh, discovered three threats saving the raw data on the server, sending the raw data to the application, and feeding and running the machine uh, learning model. The problem here is if one of these uh, threats goes wrong, uh, we could have uh, not. Uh, we could have a uh, uh, particularly uh, dangerous event for customers or flyer for individuals. In fact, it uh, it's possible to have unwanted modification of data. It's possible to have not legal access to data. It's possible to have data uh, disappearance. So. By using the data, uh, the data protection impact assessment uses, uh, includes sorry, uh, uh, some software tools. By using these tools and uh, editing uh, and uh, editing uh, some values in uh, in the forms of this tool, it's possible to have a sort of picture that represents the risk overview uh, with uh, for the for the the system as you can see in this feature, in this image on the left side uh, there are uh, uh, a lot of information that bring us the uh, risk level for the uh, um, system i mean potential impact for individuals threats sources in the sources there are the machine and deep learning server staff of tech support, edge server, and controls that actually uh, Flybell staff applies. In or, in, indeed, in order to mitigate the risk level, Flybell staff applies a lot of controls. I mean, logical access controls. Uh, they are hardening, they, uh, they apply the best practice in terms of hardening servers and the systems, uh, upgrading and uh, patching uh, uh, servers, uh, devices, uh, uh, routers, and uh, they also apply the best practice in terms of backup, etc., etc. Uh, the uh, data protection impact assessment show us uh, the uh, possible uh, event uh, that we must care about this situation, this configuration. The most important event that we must care is not is the illegal access to data because uh, the probability of event is not so low and the, the risk severity is important because, as you can see, it it's possible to have uh, uh, impacts, physical impact on for a customer. It's impossible, uh, just for example, uh, uh, if uh, uh, not uh, as a consequence of not legal access to data, it's possible to go to uh, to visit the uh, the house of uh, uh, a customer without uh, the permission of the uh, customer. Then we uh, uh, perform a new uh, uh, experiment, this time using a uh, um, uh, non anonymous data set. So we applied a, uh, some anonymous techniques uh, in order to try to um, mitigate the uh, risk level. Uh, the, in this slide, as you can see, we, we uh, have the same potential impacts, the same threads, the same sources, the same controls, because the software architecture is the same. 
one Arm Linux server that collects personal data, the same number of radio devices, the same number of uh, uh, routers, same version of, of, of operating system firmware, and uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. But in this case, because we switch uh, from uh, uh, um, raw data set to anonymous data set, the, uh, the tool from data protection impact assessment show us a better situation. Now we must care about the not legal access to data because the uh, severity of risk is limited. It is low, but the probability or the likelihood of the event is very, very low. Uh, in order to show um, a best, a, a, a best picture, I put on this slide the uh, risk mapping from uh, uh, raw data set and risk mapping from anonymous data set. As you can see on the right side, the uh, situation is better in the, in, indeed. Here we must care about this event not legal access to data because the level risk is important and the probability is uh, uh, limited. Now, on the right side, the uh, level of risk is uh, very limited because we simply delete a lot of uh, all personal information and uh, the same and the probability of event is very, very uh low so what about the uh, conclusions and the future works in this study uh, we studied the, the impact of uh, obfuscation techniques on uh, uh, personal data because we wanted to try to mitigate the data breach risks on the personal uh, data uh, the result showed that some techniques some techniques are really good uh, in the, um, uh, for the mitigation of the risk level, but the same, time, the same uh, techniques are not so good in terms of fault prediction. So in the next future, we aim to explore with uh, better detail the obfuscation uh, techniques because we wanted the first goal is uh, always is to have the lower risk level for individuals and the second goal is to have a good performance in terms of uh, uh, full uh, prediction so uh thanks for uh, your time uh, uh, any question Okay, uh, thank you uh, to Carlos Angets. And uh, everyone have a question? Okay, uh, just a moment that uh, um, we are checking the chat to see if okay. everyone has it. Okay, uh, so uh, I have a question uh, for you, and my question was about, uh, uh, I mean, the architecture uh, ah. to this kind of uh, uh, of works, and uh, in particular, if you want, uh, if you have an idea to improve this uh, this architecture in the next future. Uh, uh, change, yes. I mean. oh, okay. uh, uh, so, well, and in, in a very um, um first times of our experiment uh, we use the same architecture that the flyber uh, actually use i mean uh, one single linux arm server and uh, uh, the radio devices on the field in the uh, in the next uh, future uh, we we will try to add more and more uh, Linux ARM servers in order to collect more and more data, uh, in order to, um, if it's possible, to um, distribute the load 
uh, of uh, um, CPU, uh, the, the, the load of calculus uh, to all Linux R servers. The problem here is uh, that uh, if we add more and more Linux R servers, uh, we, uh, we are sure that we have best performance in terms of uh, fault prediction. But in the same way, as a consequence of adding more and more Linux servers, maybe uh, we could have uh, um, a risk level not so limited because uh, the, the data uh, will be sent to more Linux server. Uh, and uh, so the um, the old system will be bigger, and if the system will be bigger, the same probability of that an event goes wrong is uh, is higher. Uh, anyway, we will try uh, uh, add the new uh, server, and we will try to find um, a techniques of anonymization that uh, uh, could could help us to improve the performance in terms of fault prediction. We always wanted a low level of risk uh, okay. for, uh, okay? Okay. Okay. Thank you a lot. Another Thank you. To Carl Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Okay. So it's time to the next presentation. Our next uh, presenter is uh, Antonio Scarfo. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, so Antonio Scarfo from uh, Università di Salerno. Uh, have a presentation entitled on uh, IoT localization architecture, comparison, and privacy concerns in the healthcare sector. So uh, the stage is yours. You can start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Could you see my presentation? Uh, Antonio, we see your presentation, oh, but we it. see the presenter side of your presentation, not the okay. main. I, I, you need to switch the monitor. That's something different. Oh, I think you will try to present in a window. Yes. Just a so moment. You can the windows is more simple. Now it's better. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. And uh, uh, I'm glad to be here to present my my paper. Uh, on IoT localization, architecture, comparison, and privacy concerns in the healthcare sector. I'm uh, an, a PhD student at the University of Salerno, Computer Science Department, uh, and the curriculum of uh, Internet of Things and Smart Technologies. And my paper is related to um, the application on localization in, uh, in healthcare sector. Uh, that's why the relevance of the matter is very important at this moment, uh, mainly in the, in the pandemic uh, uh, situation. And uh, we can see that these three um, analysts forecast a brilliant future for this kind of application. Because basically, this application can uh, improve the efficiency of the operation in the healthcare and also the effectiveness of the treatment of the patient. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the idea uh, is uh, to uh, try to catch as much as possible the benefit from this kind of application, uh, creating uh, uh, an initial uh, starting toolbox for the designer that uh, allow to even roughly uh, suggest what kind of architecture could be the most suitable, most adapted, uh, for a given uh, use case. So given the requirements of a use case of application localization, what kind of uh, architecture should I uh, uh, utilize for, uh, for uh, catch as much as possible the benefit of this, uh, this technology, this application? This is uh, the aim of the work. So uh, how I try to do it? 
basically um, the idea is to create uh, a framework uh, of uh, a set of parameters of the evaluation parameters that uh, are used to compare solution and basically these parameters are uh, the, re the most common requirements of the application localization application localization solution so this initial toolbox <clears throat> include the four cases uh, that i selected uh, basically using the um, seeing at uh, looking at the most uh, look, looking for the most common wireless technologies and the cases uh, really used so on field uh, used or on field at least tested and uh, narrowing the the, the research uh, in uh, of course healthcare sector and i or triple e um, search engine then i compare these uh, cases trying to estimate uh, the parameters that are selected in the framework and uh, create a rank among uh, these, uh, these cases selected parameters by parameters. At the end, uh, I try to uh, create a tool, um, a graph tool to uh, quickly uh, identify the right solution given the, the requirements of the use case. The premise is that, uh, is that um, we can see in this slide that the, the, the parameters I selected are a range of coverage uh, of the solution, latency, accuracy, power consumption, scalability, cost, and privacy. This is a, a set uh, that could be uh, wider, make more wider, uh, but I, I started from these uh, very common requirements. And uh, the premise is that uh, not all these, uh, these parameters are uh, uh, clearly uh, extrapolable from the uh, case analysis. When uh, is, it, is not, it is not possible, because it is not in the description of the cases, uh, I used the, the literature and um, in order to create this, this rank, I don't want to give a, a precise measurement, but just a, a, a comparison, a rank, uh, parameters by parameters uh, among these, uh, these cases. So. Regarding the, 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 the privacy, uh, the analysis uh, um, is uh, related to two pillars, two, two, the, the main pillars, uh, perception layer, then the, the age devices and network layers. Uh, I, don't, uh, I didn't include uh, processing layers and application layers uh, in this phase because uh, the case description uh, are not very rich about uh, about these two, these two other pillars of the security issue. And I used the, the form that you can see in the slide, the, the PIA of CNIL, uh, part of this form to have a comparison in terms of uh, privacy among the cases I selected. Using this, um, the, the framework, the, the matrix uh, uh, in the slide, I related the, the risk uh, in, in the framework, illegitimate access to personal data, unwanted change of data, and disappearance of data with uh, the risk sources and the mind traits. Basically, the mind traits are then used to um, create uh, a, the, consequence, the consequences for the privacy impacts. For each attack, we have a privacy impacts method in this, uh, in this matrix. This is the premise. The cases. I selected, the, selected the, these four cases. We can see uh, one case uh, related to the patient uh, discovery presence and the vitals um, um, collecting based on RFID and the wireless sensor networks 802.15.4. Another case uh, based on uh, RSSI uh, methodology for distance um, calculation and uh, Bluetooth low energy protocol that, is, uh, that has the aim to, to track patients. Another uh, case, the third case uh, is based on RSSI again and Wi-Fi. This is an already uh, installed uh, infrastructure. And also in this case, we have the patient tracking as an objective. 
And the last one is another Wi-Fi infrastructure, um, but the, the, the localization is uh, in a device-free fashion. That's mean that the target uh, uh, has not a device with him. Those four cases uh, are um, compared uh, in reference with the, the, the parameters I listed uh, below before. And uh, again, uh, there is uh, in this slide uh, a, a summary. Range of coverage is calculated in anchors, um, so infrastructure device for uh, square meters. The latency is uh, the time uh, that is needed to have the localization. This is a roughly comparison based on post elaboration requirement. Uh, there is not a clearly uh, estimable uh, time in this case, but uh, I know we know about uh, the post elaboration uh, requirements of the, the architecture. The accuracy is clearly uh, descriptive and uh, est uh, estimated in, uh, in the cases. Power consumption is another case that is another parameter that is not uh, clearly uh, estimable from the, the cases. So we, I, I, I did a, a, a comparison using uh, some elements in literatures. Uh, again, for scalability, uh, there are not so many information about scalability, about how many target is are sustainable uh, keeping the, the accuracy. And uh, I used the information coming from the transmission protocol, wireless protocol, and the costs uh, are uh, simply uh, estimable using market costs from devices and uh, the markets for, for square meter for the infrastructure. So as you can see, we have some parameters clearly estimable, estimable from the cases and other uh, parameters that uh, I, I need, I, I, I did uh, estimate, estimate uh, using uh, information from uh, the, the literature. The result is that uh, um, uh, is reported in this in this matrix where uh, um, we have uh, the um, the comparison uh, parameters by parameters uh, case by case. When we can see that uh, we we can say that a case is better over. Another case, uh, parameter by parameters, and in the fourth column, uh, there is uh, um, descriptive the, the the domain of application when is uh, usable to to imply the the solution. In the first case, for instance, it's uh, useful to use uh, to imply the, the the solution when uh, high energy efficiency is required, accuracy is required in meters. Coverage is in meters, and uh, uh, there is no latency in the in the localization uh, inside, and so on. In order to have a, a more uh, fast uh, mean to uh, discover the domain of application, um, again, it's not an absolute uh, calculation, but it's a relative calculation. It's a comparison by these uh, four cases. I reported, I tried to score the, the comparison, I reported the score in this uh, radar graph where it's possible to appreciate uh, more uh, fast uh, and clearly the domain of applicability. Uh, again, uh, case one is not so uh, good for cost devices, uh, is in the middle uh, for scalability, uh, is excellent for latency and power consumption. And so on. You can uh, you can uh, see very clearly the applicability of the four cases selected. Uh, some uh, warning related to the case three, where uh, uh, Wi-Fi need for uh, four minutes for a multi-hopping activity for discover all the access point and uh, uh, rec record the accuracy declared uh, claimed, and uh, the case four where uh, um, it, it gets wrong quickly in accuracy if uh, uh, there are multi-target in the, in the scenario of, uh, of application. Related to the, the privacy, 
um, what I did is to um, take the, uh, the age of the devices and the, uh, the protocol used in the cases and match uh, them with the threats I show in the previous slides. From that, uh, I evaluate the risks. Uh, I, I did a qualitative evaluation of the risks. And I reported this evaluation in the metrics that you can see. Well, the, 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 the red color means that uh, the, the age and the, the network are uh, more, uh, more risky uh, uh, compared to the other, uh, to the other uh, age uh, devices and network protocol used in the other cases. The, the main uh, issue we can, we can have in this, uh, in this analysis for privacy are basically the discovery of the path of the patient or the, um, the observation of the vital data uh, transmitted by the infrastructure. For the future works, um, uh, I learned that it's possible to improve uh, the, the parameters that are not clearly uh, estimable uh, from the cases like scalability, latency, power consumption and try to have a more um, precise score uh, in risk estimation. Also, um, of course, it's possible to try to um, create a correlation among the, the, the parameters, because the parameters are correlated among them, and uh, also adding other cases or other um, environment condition in order to increase the tool, toolbox uh, for the estimation for the evaluation of the solution given a uh, use case requirements. That's all. Thank you for your time. I, I'm free for, uh, I'm available for the questions. Okay. Uh, thank you to Antonio Scarfo. Uh, uh, does anyone uh, have any question for Antonio? Okay. Antonio, so I have a question uh, uh, for you. And yeah. um, that's, I mean, a general question about uh, the topics of your paper. And my, my, question, uh, uh, my question is, uh, do you think that this kind of technologies are quite ready to production environment? I mean, do you think this is mature for using a real uh, production environment? Yeah, I think uh, I think yes. Uh, there are uh, ma many installation. Uh, the problem is uh, the dimensioning and the design of the of the architecture. Uh, once uh, the requirements as uh, is given, in other words, uh, we can imply this uh, infrastructure. Uh, but uh, we have to put um, a lot of attention in the, the infrastructure dimension, the, the scalability, the infer interference, and uh, it's usable, useful to do some test on field in order to create the right environment to have the, the accuracy required, the, the, the power consumption required, and so on. Then at the end of the day, I think yes, but uh, a fine tuning activity uh, is needed. Okay, uh, thanks a lot uh, to Antonio Scarfo and the way. Thanks. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. So it's time to the next uh, uh, talk. Uh, next talk was presented by uh, Mariam Gerard. I hope that I am the right pronunciation of your name. And the title of uh, your talk is uh, True Seeker Chain, Leveraging uh, uh, Invisible Capture, SSI and Blockchain uh, to Combat Disinformation Social Media. Uh, yes, hello everyone. Uh, hello. So uh, my name is uh, Miriam Gerard. I'm uh, currently postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Padova, Italy. Uh, today, I'm going to present uh, the research work uh, through Ticker Chain, uh, leveraging uh, invisible capture, um, SSI, and the blockchain to combat uh, uh, disinformation on social media networks. I will uh, share my screen. Yeah. Uh, can you see uh, the full screen? Yeah. 
Yeah, perfect. Okay. Uh, so, uh, as you might uh, have noticed, uh, recently this information has become a worrisome phenomenon at a global scale, spreading rapidly thanks to the growth of social media networks. It impacts not only the political sphere, but also economic, social, and cultural aspects uh, of life, from uh, personal mindsets uh, about vaccination to disavowing cultures or uh, different opinions. So, uh, the, and this is mainly due to the fact that uh, today anyone can create news and spread it uh, with very high visibility without any kind of filter, which make it hard for the users of social media networks uh, to distinguish between real and fake news. To the address this issue, recently multiple content verification tools have been proposed. Uh, however, these tools didn't have a real impact uh, on combating the fake news spreading. And this is mainly because um, the users have to check the veracity of each uh, social media post separately, which is unrealistic and time consuming. So uh, in order to uh, design an effective solution that fight fake news spreading, uh, it is important to understand how the fake news go viral. Unfortunately, uh, a recent study found out that uh, humans are also contributing in the spreading of fake news. So uh, besides humans, the most used tools and techniques to spread fake news uh, are uh, social bots, trolls, uh, deep fakes, and micro-targeting. In the following slides, uh, we will uh, present a uh, truth seeker chain and how it addresses these problems. So, a uh, truth seeker chain, or TSC for short, is an open ecosystem that uh, aims at mitigating fake news spreading on the existing social media networks and in an innovative way. The main idea behind it is to aggregate news, facts, and claims from the existing social media networks in one place, where the verification and the social network analysis tools can be applied, and the users um, sign in using their real identity, using SSI, and multiple independent verifiers around the world can compete to check the content veracity. Um, through Seeker Chain incentivize the users to verify content and to engage only with likely true content by offering them uh, TSC tokens. Um, TSC tokens are utility tokens uh, which use the same uh, standard used by Bitcoin called ERC20. And these tokens uh, can be used uh, to buy NFTs in the platform. Uh, reducing the user's engagement with fake news means decreasing their visibility in the, the existing social media networks and thus reducing their impact. Now let's see how uh, TSC works. Uh, all uh, TSC members have to install uh, an identity wallet such as Transic ID wallet in their uh, smartphones in order to uh, uh, in order to uh, sign in to TSC with their real identity using a uh, self sovereign identity model. So, uh, TSC use SSI for authentication to ensure accountability and to contribute building a reliable portable reputation system. Since asking uh, users to check every social media content uh, themselves through a multiple platform is unrealistic, TSC offers content verification tools as a feature to the users while browsing uh, their favorite social media feed. In addition, uh, users will have a view of social network uh, content augmented with the new functionalities and information derived from the blockchain. We will see uh, these functionalities and information in details when we look at the proof of concept. A recent uh, study showed that uh, social bots play a key role in the spreading uh, of fake news. So in order to ensure that only humans post and engage with content, we used a bot screening mechanism called Invisible CAPTCHA, which is uh, fully transparent to the users and it is based on the TAP micro movement. 
TSC platform uh, is uh, also open to integration of third-party content verification tools. So before engaging with content, the user can verify whether the content has been tampered with or it has been taken from another context, etc. Uh, TSC smart contracts would be deployed in Alastria network and which use uh, it is a public permission in the blockchain and would be responsible for tracking users reputation rewarding the users tokenizing evidence and nft trading and finally the users can also leverage uh, social network analysis tools to visualize uh, the network of users interacting with the content to have an idea of, of uh, whom is behind it now let's have a look at the implementation. This is TSC login page. To log in, no password is required. The user has to click on sign in with credential, then scan the QR code using his SSI mobile wallet. In this case, a Transic mobile wallet. Uh, TSC sends a request to the users asking him to share some data of uh, his ID, like full name, country, and optionally diploma if he wants to be identified as an expert. The user can accept or decline the request, and like uh, the, the centralized or federated model, the user have his ID in his wallet and can control to whom and when he share it. In the case uh, the user accepts to share the credential with TSC and the verification of the signature by TSC uh, using the public keys recorded in the blockchain was successful, he will receive a notification in his wallet saying that the verification was successful and uh, he would be uh, authorized to access the platform. Uh, this is the main page of the Rootseeker chain. Uh, it looks similar to Twitter with some additional functionalities. Uh, we intended to let it look similar because most of the users are familiar with it. In the middle, the user can uh, browse his feed. Uh, on top, the user can post a tweet uh, to Twitter. In the timeline, uh, we can notice that there are two types of posts, posts not submitted yet to blockchain and posts already submitted to blockchain. You will find posts not submitted yet to blockchain with submit button. Uh, which allow the user to submit the post hash to the blockchain. The post itself is coming from Twitter and it's not recorded in the TSC database, only its hash which will be recorded in the blockchain in order to track all the actions and the engagement with the content and to figure out uh, who is responsible for spreading the fake news. Remember that users are identified by their real uh, um, identity. So uh, the users who uh, submitted the post to blockchain will be rewarded to encourage them to do that. And uh, regarding posts already submitted to blockchain will be augmented uh, with some informations and uh, uh, functionalities. Uh, there are the traditional actions such as uh, likes, uh, comment, share, and the new features like uh, the green badge that show if the author is a TSC member. Uh, the five stars represent the reputation score. The user can vote on the content veracity by voting fake or true. Uh, it's worth to mention that the user will be rewarded immediately for voting or submitting a post to the blockchain by receiving one TSC token, uh, which can be used to buy NFTs in the platform. Uh, this shows how many experts voted true or fake. Uh, this allows the users to create a campaign uh, in order to encourage the verifiers to contribute in the verification process of the post. Uh, this is to show uh, the engagement history, who did what and when. And the last button is for accessing the verification page where uh, the user can verify the post using uh, machine learning or human-based uh, tools. And can also add evidence. The evidence will be stored in IPFS. We store the evidence file in IPFS because storing it in the blockchain is expensive. We will see later on how uh, the evidence can be tokenized. Uh, so as 
you can see here the evidence will be stored in IPFS and only the hash and the description which will be stored in the blockchain. This figure show a list of three evidence with description. The user can rate the evidence, uh, but before that he can uh, open the file and check uh, its contents. And uh, he can also uh, tokenize evidence by creating uh, an NFT by filling this form. After that, the user can put their NFTs on sale to allow the others to purchase them and uh, using this button. So, uh, as I mentioned before, TSC offers a portable reputation system. So, by scanning the QR code in the left, uh, the user receives uh, the verifiable credential in uh, his wallet and he can accept or decline it. In case he accepts it, he will have it in um, his wallet and would be able to use it in other platform and context. So you might notice that in the case of the authentication, TSC is uh, the verifier of the verifiable credential. And in the case of the social reputation, TSC is the issuer of the, verifi the verifiable credentials. Uh, now let's see how TSC deal with the issues presented earlier. TSC addresses the social bot issue by using a transparent bot screening mechanism called invisible capture and solve throw Trolls problems thanks to SSI model and TSC design. Trolls are people who create mini accounts, uh, mini accounts uh, to perform malicious activities in social networks. For example, uh, spreading fake news, ruin the reputation of honest users, etc. So, thanks to SSI model and TSC design, all the users' uh, social media accounts accessed through the platform will be automatically linked to the user real identity information shared through their SSI mobile wallet. Since the users cannot have multiple uh, real identities, they can't create multiple accounts on TSC. So, um, and TSC uh, also addressed the deep fake issue by integrating third party uh, content verification tools. And finally, address micro targeting issue by returning back the control to the users on what they see using filters. This slide summarizes the main TSC features and its advantages. Among the advantages, using TSC users would be able to access their feeds from multiple social media networks in one platform and with a single login. TSC saves users effort and time spent in reading fake news that might be posted by bots or looking for the truth uh, from different places and unknown sources. Users would be uh, able also to contribute in the verification process as an expert on, or non-expert if they don't provide any diploma. And they can monetize and prove ownership of their evidence or media content using NFTs. Users uh, also can uh, receive a portable uh, social reputation uh, profile ba based on their behavior in multiple platforms, and it can be used in other contexts and platforms. Uh, TSC return back control to the users on what they see. And finally, TSC um, uh, is censorship resistant. Once uh, the smart contracts are deployed, no one can delete uh, uh, data or change how the system work and the algorithm will be transparent to the users. Uh, journalists and fact checkers can also benefit from the TSC platforms. They would uh, have access to the resources that can help them in their investigation and they can as well buy NFTs that represent uh, ownership of media file to use them in their blogs and articles. Involving the user in the verification process, we save them a lot of time. Um, for future work, we plan to integrate content verification and social analysis tools to the current proof of concept. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you to thank you. Dr. Gerard. Uh, anyone have a question? Okay, uh, so uh, I have a question, um, and it's about the 
uh, main use case of this platform. Okay, uh, let me to explain better my question is uh, uh, the main use case of this platform is that uh, only one instance of this platform is deployed and everyone use only one instance of this uh, platform, right? Or you can have multiple instances, uh, for example, for multiple um, companies or for multiple, or for different companies, I mean. Uh, for the moment, uh, the proof of concept, uh, we integrated only t Twitter, but um, in the future, uh, the or the next step would be to uh, also add the feeds from uh, Facebook and uh, the other social media networks. So it would be uh, with the single assign, um, uh, login, you will access all your social media platforms uh, and it would be augmented with some information and new features. Okay, thanks. Thank you, thank you very much. I think that is uh, the last uh, the last talk of this session. But I just want uh, uh, to remember uh, to everyone that we have another uh, talk of this workshop that will be um, the next uh, uh, fifth day at uh, I don't remember the, uh, the right. Uh, I mean, okay, at ten o'clock. So uh, that's all uh, for everyone. Goodbye to everyone. Bye.